I, I know the, the way this works. It's evening for you, but these are uh, quite literally the first words out of my mouth this morning. Um, uh, in fact, uh, as class was getting started, my alarm on my phone just went off that it's time to wake up because um, it's it's six in the morning here right now. Uh, and, I, and I was mentioning I'm I'm actually in my basement this morning. Normally, I'd be teaching from my office, but we're supposed to get a foot of snow today, just just today. Um, and I didn't feel like clearing that out before 6 a.m. to uh, <laughs> to get up to the office. Uh, so I'm I'm teaching from my my basement this morning. Um, just remind me really quick. I, I'm I I'm from previous times here. This is two hours, right? Yes. We okay. Just wanted, over. To, yep. just, just wanted to just wanted to make sure. All right, so we're going to start in Romans one now. Just just help me out um, because um, obviously with the uh, rotating cast of teachers, um, I'm assuming you've been introduced to the book of Romans already, right? Is this a, a series or am I am I up first? Uh, you're you're up a fourth already, so. Uh, we've, we've had three lessons already. Okay. Yeah. So um, I, I've been asked by Joel to do Romans 1, especially as it... ...18 uh, of Romans 1. Um, and and just structurally to, to uh, get what's going on here. And again, I suspect this is already familiar to, to many of you. Um, the first say two and a half chapters of Romans, is, is Paul making a case um, that everybody everywhere needs a savior. Um, I, I regularly uh, phrase it this way to our church, that the good news of the gospel, the good news is only as good as the bad news is bad. Um, I don't know how it is um, in the in the places that all of you minister to, but I know here um, I have I have told people you can gather a lot about people's theology by attending funerals, and one of the things you find attending funerals is that um, you learn quickly everybody goes to heaven. Right, that's something you learn as you attend funerals is is everybody goes to heaven. And, and in fact, if you ask people, um, but what most people's theology is, is unless you have devoted your life to purposefully being evil and malicious, you go to heaven, right? I mean, that's, again, at least where I am, that is most people's conception of uh, how heaven and hell work is you would you have to like work hard to be bad enough to go to hell. Um, obviously, then that runs very much counter to what scripture teaches. Um, and I've I've tried to present to people, I, I think, from the words of Christ, that the single most sobering passage in all of scripture is when Christ says the way to destruction is broad and many find it. The way to life is narrow. And few find it. And in the same passage in Matthew 7, when Jesus says, many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, and I'll say, I never knew you, depart from me. You, you put those passages together. And the, the notion that the overwhelming mass of humanity is condemned, um, that idea is, is, is very essential because you, you, you have to go to people um, and, and in many cases, convince them that they need a savior, right? To present Jesus as a savior is mystifying to people until they have come to a place where they, they grasp that they would have some need to be rescued. Um, and so that's really where Paul starts, right? The great turning point in Romans is Romans 3, um, uh, but now uh, the righteousness of God is revealed by faith. Uh, Romans 3, verse 21. Everything up to that point, starting in verse 18 of, of chapter 1, is Paul making the case of universal condemnation, that everybody stands guilty before God and therefore needs a means of righteousness apart from the law, right? 
And, and so starting in chapters two and three, Paul gets a little bit more specific. Uh, chapters two and three, especially chapter two, Paul deals systematically um, with the idea that both Jew and Gentile alike are condemned, right? He's, he gets into those specifics that um, whether you have the law or you don't have the law, uh, if you have the law, you know the law, and you don't keep it, the law condemns you. If you don't have the law, you have uh, something of the law of God written on your heart, and you don't live up to that. And so in, in every case, you're condemned, right? He, he gets into sort of the details in chapter 2. In chapter 1, I think Paul is, is uh, presenting for us sort of the broad picture of, of universal condemnation. Um, he is... He is looking at the, the mass, the, the uh, scope of humanity, and, and um, showing us, convincing us that man left to his own devices is without hope of redemption, that, that he is, um, and, and, and these are words that we use all the time, but I, I think kind of need to be rehabilitated to further meaning, that man is lost. Right, uh, it's um, one of my um, uh, less important missions in life. Um, lost is a really descriptive word, um, or or the idea that we have been saved. Um, saved is a word that we use so frequently. I think it's been emptied of meaning. Um, but that idea that we we are those who need to be rescued and have been rescued uh, through a, a no participation of our own right? Saved is a really good word. So is lost. And, and don't let those words get emptied of meaning through frequent use. Um, Romans 1, we see the lostness of humanity. And so let's, let's dive into the text, um, starting in verse 18. And we're just going to work our way through this kind of in a, in a running commentary mode um, with a view toward um, the ways in which humanity's rejection of God um, uh, cuts them off from understanding reality, right? So, so that's kind of the, the, the lens through which I want us to see Romans 1. And, and that's going to be um, relevant, right, just to kind of uh, preview where we're going. Um, what Paul is going to tell us is that depravity darkens the mind. Depravity darkens the mind. And that has implications for our defense of Christianity. Um, so just, just kind of uh, backing things up theologically. Um, when we think of depravity, um, and without getting into all the uh, nitty-gritty details of, of the, the, the uh, controversy in theology... Protestants have typically affirmed what we call total depravity. And the idea of total depravity is not ever that man is as, unbelieving man is as wicked as he possibly could be, right? That's not what total depravity means. Total depravity means that our sinfulness affects every aspect of our being, and there are not exceptions, right? So the contrast to total depravity is really what you find in most of Roman Catholicism, especially as influenced by Thomas Aquinas, that, that in Thomistic um, uh, theology, man is, is uh, certainly sinful, but for the most part, his intellect escapes being thoroughly warped by his sinfulness. That, that man's mind... Um, becomes an avenue by which you can appeal to him and seek his redemption, because man is is very, very capable of of grasping logic and rationality, right? And so, uh, Thomistic apologetics, for that reason, tends to um, have a heavy emphasis on on logic and rationality. Um, that this is the means by which the unbelieving man remains accessible to us. Does that, you're tracking the, the difference there. Whereas if we follow, and I, I don't mean to put too sharp a point on it, but if we follow Paul instead of Thomas, what we, what we realize is that man's mind is 
is warped by sin just as much as all the rest of him is, right? His, his heart is affected by sin. His volition is affected by sin, but his mind is affected by sin as well, right? And so the idea that he, he has a bad will or a ba- and a bad heart, but his mind is, is really running on the right rails, and so we can we can appeal to him intellectually, and and that's going to be all good. Um, I think Paul is going to make it very clear that is a really hopeless case, right? That is not, in fact, what's going on here. And and so we're going to have to wrestle through this um, this morning, um, because there's two ditches, right? Let's let's kind of lay that out. There's two ditches that we can fall into when it comes to thinking about the unbeliever and his mind and apologetics. The one is that the unbeliever's mind is unaffected by sin. And therefore, what we need is this sort of rational, intellectual, evidential appeal that if we could just get the right arguments and evidence in front of him, he would he would necessarily feel compelled to embrace the faith. Right? The other ditch is man's uh, unbelieving man's mind is corrupted by sin and therefore, any rational appeal is hopeless. It doesn't matter. We can't appeal to him at all, right? And this is really where you get into an apologetics version of what we would what we would call hyper Calvinism, right? There is no apologetic. There is no way of reaching the unbeliever. His mind is darkened, and so you can't talk to him at all, right? Do you do you, do you see those two ditches, right? One is Man, it's, you know, the unbelieving mind is unaffected by sin. The other is the unbelieving mind is affected by sin and makes it so that you can't converse with him, all right? What we're going to find is saying the truth is somewhere in between is more or less right, but it doesn't make our answer any easier. Um. Because what it results in, and, and I, I hope and I trust most of you have been able to read the selection from Frame that I passed along for you to read this week. When Frame tar- starts talking about how the unbeliever knows and doesn't know simultaneously, how much fun was that to sort through? Right? It's not easy. Right, the, the 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 two ditches that the unbeliever, uh, either in a in a Thomistic sense, is just capable of knowing, right, in a, in a really unaffected by sin sort of way, that would be easy to articulate, or the idea that the unbeliever is just left in in just total idiocy, right? He just his mind is so warped that he knows nothing, that would be easy to explain. But the idea that the unbeliever somehow simultaneously knows and doesn't know um, is very difficult to articulate in any way that makes sense. And yet I think it's the, what, is, what it ends up being faithful to the biblical text, right? So that's kind of prelude. That's the question in front of us as we look at what Paul says here as it relates to the, the unbeliever's knowledge. So let's start in, in verse 18 as, as Paul begins to lay out his case. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. So already we see that the main topic that Paul is um, uh, beginning to unpack here in in Romans 1 is that we are rightly the objects of God's wrath. We are under judgment, right? As we get to chapter 3, what what Paul needs us to understand is if we are to escape God's wrath— we need righteousness, right? I mean, this is simple stuff, but we, we, we just need to make sure we, we get the big blocks in place here. That, that God is, is here by Paul being uh, uh, focused on, portrayed as the judge who is full of righteous wrath against sin and sinners, right? And so the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all unrighteousness, 
and 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 this is uh, this is again um uh we're going to be two more chapters until paul says so how do we get out from under that wrath where is a righteousness available to us that we can actually attain right that's what he's driving toward but in order to get there he has to show us that we are by nature and by choice under the wrath of god right and we're under the wrath of god because of unrighteousness and ungodliness and then at the end of verse 18 we've got a phrase that that um uh becomes immediately relevant um to our discussion of romans 1 and apologetics who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth um gk chesterton who is one of my my favorite writers and a guy who I, I lament became a, a Roman Catholic. Um, just a brilliant, brilliant writer. If you if you want to uh, uh, improve your writing, um, Chesterton is a great guy to read because he's he's so able to to turn a phrase. But it, but he has one line that I I quote often. He says the unbeliever can't find God for the same reason that a criminal can't find a policeman. I think that's a really important idea, right? The unbeliever is, when, when we talk about apologetics and we are sitting down with an unbeliever and trying to make the case for Christianity, the unbeliever is not neutral as to the question about God. Because it, and he's not neutral because if the Christian God exists, the unbeliever is accountable to him, right? The unbeliever is guilty before God. And so the unbeliever has a built in incentive to find that Christianity is false, right? We've got to understand that going into the discussion is, um, even uh, a, a kind and generous unbeliever, as we're having a conversation, who's looking at it and says, you know, hey, I'm willing to have this discussion. I'm seeking. I'm looking. Right. All of those things. And, and, and my, my point here is not necessarily to uh, cast um, uh, doubts on the sincerity of, of, of every unbeliever. But, my, but the point is, as Paul says, the unbeliever is in a position of being condemned by God. And therefore, his default setting is to take the truth about God and to hold it down, right? He's not, he's not just, hey, I want to look at the evidence neutrally. I'm, I'm undecided, but, you know, let's, let's consider this impartially. The unbeliever is very partial, right? Because if you're right, he's condemned. And, and so right from the outset, Paul tells us, and, and, and let's, let me just add this idea right here. When we sit down with the unbeliever to defend the faith, um, good manners sometimes suggest that what we need to do is let's both, the unbeliever and I, be impartial here. Right. This is kind of a traditional approach to apologetics is here's the unbeliever sitting across the table from me. Here's me. And I want to show him that Christianity is true. Right. But I don't want to uh, do so in a way that just assumes that I'm right about everything. Right. So that the, the, the way that, that the uh, task of apologetics is often presented is the unbeliever and I sit down and we're neither going to, neither of us should assume our own conclusions, but rather we should sit down impartially and just look at the logic and evidence and, and be willing to go wherever it leads, right? That's that idea of neutrality. And you see this very often in um, uh, those who would defend what, what are often called an evidential or a classical version of apologetics. Um, I have a number of concerns with that, but, but one of them is this, when I sit down with an unbeliever, does Christianity stop being true while that conversation is taking place? 
And the answer, hopefully, obviously, is no. Christianity remains true while that conversation is happening, which means, and this is key, the unbeliever still is what scripture says he is while that conversation is taking place, right? The unbeliever might sit down and present himself as a neutral um, a, a follower of truth, right? Wherever it goes, but he's not, right? Because Christianity is still true while I'm talking to him. I know things about the unbeliever, whether the unbeliever is willing to accept them about himself or not, because the Bible is true, right? Now, that doesn't mean I have to be a jerk about it, right? Well, actually, <laughs> you know, it's actually the case that you're not what you say you are. But it's important for me to know that when I sit down with the unbeliever to talk, he is not what he thinks he is, right? He is not a neutral seeker after truth, but rather he is, and we're going to see this as the text unfolds, he is a created image bearer of God who in fact knows God and hates God and is suppressing the truth. Right, And I know that about him because scripture tells me that about him. And, and in many ways, this, this, this begins to shape my strategy as I sit down and talk to the unbeliever. Um, but let, let, let's keep reading because we'll, we'll get into sort of the, the, the strategy of the conversation here. But I want us to, to establish that point that verse 18 tells us the unbeliever is suppressing truth. Does the unbeliever think he's doing that? Is that how the unbeliever conceives of himself, as he is one who is sitting there suppressing the truth? No, that's not how he conceives of himself. That's not how he thinks about himself. But that's what Paul says that he's doing, right? And that informs my understanding of the conversation. I know going in that the unbeliever knows certain truths, that he is trying very hard to hold those truths down. Um, he's not neutral about them. He, it, it, there's two things that help me already in, in, in what we've seen so far, is that the unbeliever knows certain truths. I'm not introducing, them to the, introducing these tr truths to him that he has never heard before, right? He knows these things. And I also know that he's suppressing them, which means my apologetic task uh, in some way changes from introducing him to facts to exposing to him that he's suppressing the truth, right? Do you see my mission as an apologist has, has changed slightly? All right, verse 19. How do we know the unbeliever is suppressing truth? What is it that he's suppressing? For what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. And I just want to tag in the, the first phrase of verse 21. For although they knew God. All right. So we see in verse 18, the unbeliever knows truth, right? He is not ignorant of the truth about God, but rather he knows it and is suppressing the truth. Verses 19 through the beginning of verse 21, Paul begins to explain what he means when he says that the unbeliever is suppressing the truth. And what he drives to is verse 21. And this is um, key. It's very key for obviously the reading that you did. Paul is very comfortable saying that the unbeliever knows God. For although they knew God, they did something with that knowledge. 
Um, I think it's right here to take Paul at face value. Um, so in just evangelical Christianity broadly, um, you'll hear people talk about the need to have a personal relationship with God. What Paul tells us is everybody already has a personal relationship with God, right? It's not a question of whether you have a personal relationship with God. It's a question of whether that relationship with God is one of friendship or enmity, <laughs> right? Everybody has a personal relationship with God. And, and that's not a trivial or, or glib um, observation. What Paul is saying here is that the unbeliever knows God, right? Is not just like um, a broadly aware that there is a God. But Paul's language is that the unbeliever knows God and rejects him, right? He has a personal relationship with God, but it is one of rejection and animosity. It is one in which the unbeliever refuses to accept that God is who God is. The unbeliever knows God. Well, how is it that the unbeliever knows God? And that's where verses 19 and 21 come into play. Pardon me. The unbeliever knows God because he is walking around in God's world. And, and here is where I, I think our doctrine of creation becomes very, very important. There's a an apologist I read one time that, that gave me a phrase that I really, really love. It's an English pun, so pardon me for um, that, but it's it's a simple pun, and so uh, it should be should be very clear. Um, he says that we live in God's spoken world, right? We often speak of a, a spoken word, but we live in God's spoken world, right? So if we if we take a, I think, a biblical view of Genesis 1, everything is what it is because God spoke it to being that way, right? God creates by his word. He speaks and things come to be. That is why the world is revelation. It is the word of God made visible. Does that make sense? The world is the word of God in visible form. God speaks and it is. So when you walk around in the world, you are walking around in the visible word of God. Right Now, let's be clear about this. The, the, the created world is not as clear a word of God particularly when it comes to the message of redemption, as the written word of God is, right? Um, uh, there is no... Yeah, th th yeah this, that, that's exactly right. Um, there, there is no thought in Scripture that the message of salvation is written in nature, right? But what is, um, as Paul says here, the character and nature, the person of God is seen in the created world. And here, I, I think uh, Paul wouldn't object if, if, if we loop in here, the two clearest avenues of natural revelation are the created world and then man himself, right? The unbeliever is an image bearer of God, right? So when the unbeliever looks around outside him at the world that God has made by his word, or when the unbeliever looks at himself, he himself is an image bearer of God. He sees a dim, broken, but true reflection of who God is in his own being. And in this, then, the unbeliever knows God. And, and we can't downplay that. Right, because what Paul is doing, and this is this is really key to understanding Paul's argument. Why is Paul making such a big deal 
about saying that the unbeliever knows God. Well, remember, what is Paul doing these first two and a half chapters of Romans? He is driving toward what conclusion? All people everywhere are what? Yeah, all people everywhere are condemned. They're under the wrath of God. Yeah, that, that's exactly right. They are guilty and liable to judgment, which which means, and this is this is a hard truth, right? Let's let's be honest. This is not an, a, a a pleasant or easy truth. But what Paul is saying is God's revelation of Himself in the created world is sufficient that the rejection of God in the created world is sufficient to condemn people eternally. That is a hard truth for a lot of people, right? And, and I, I think it, it, it should be um, the, the, I think for all of us, it should be something that we recognize as not a enjoyable or pleasant truth, but it is a necessary truth, right? We never want to give the impression that anyone every, anyone anywhere, right? It is never the case that someone had good reasons for disbelieving God. Right? No one anywhere has good reason for disbelieving God. What Paul is arguing here, right? Look at verses 19 and, and, and 20 again. What can be known about God is plain to them. His, his nature has been clearly perceived, and he's dri what he drives to the end of verse 20. So they are without excuse. Now, literally, and some of you know this in Greek, that word there, without excuse, in Greek is, they are without an apologetic. That's the Greek word there. They are, their position, Paul says, right? So, apologetics, um, um, uh, this is one of the um, oddest quirks. I don't know, did, I, I don't know, I, I believe uh, it reflected here in this class are many, many languages. Um and I don't know if you've got a word like apology in all of your languages, but it's a very weird thing in English. So the the we we when we talk about apologetics, it comes from a Greek word that means to make a defense, right? It, it would be used most um, specifically in a legal context, right? You're charged with a crime, and you go before the court to protest this charge and to proclaim your innocence, you are, in Greek, making your apology. In English, that has been entirely turned on its head. In English, if you apologize, you're admitting guilt and, and asking for forgiveness, right? I, I have no idea what we did to this poor word to turn it inside out in, in English, um, where it means exactly the opposite. Of, of what it meant in Greek. And I, like I say, I don't know if, uh, if uh, uh, other languages, if uh, this poor word has suffered the same fate. Um, that idea that we are offering a defense for our position, that our position is in fact defensible, right? We are giving reasons that our belief is um, uh, legitimate, right? We're not pleading guilty. Um, what Paul is saying, and, and I want us to grasp this this morning or this evening, Paul is saying that the unbelieving position is not defensible. It's not excusable. It is culpable, right? When the unbeliever rejects God, it is not Oh, well, I guess it's understandable that he would come to that conclusion. No, Paul wants us to come to the other side and say, the fact that he has come to that conclusion already shows his hostility to God. He is rejecting 
what should have been plain to him. Right? Do you, do you see, Paul is making a really extraordinary claim here. Because what, what, what he is, he's saying, and this is why I wanted us to see, he is, he is building his case that when, when God drops the judicial gavel and declares them guilty and sentences them to hell, God has acted justly. In other words, they should have known. They should have come to a different conclusion. Now, that's a hard word. Right? That's a hard word. But we can't back off from what Paul is saying here. right? It's, it's similar in some ways um, in the Gospels. Um, Jesus has conversations with the Pharisees, or uh, I think particularly after the resurrection, right? You remember he's he's on the uh, Emmaus Road and he's walking with these disciples, and um, it's one of I, I think my favorite comedic scenes in all of Scripture when when these guys ask Jesus, "Haven't you heard what happened in Jerusalem these last couple of days?" and and Jesus basically says, "Let me know, guys." <laughs> Right, as though Jesus didn't know what had happened in Jerusalem to him these these past couple of days, um, and and as they tell him, Jesus, you know, we thought he was the Messiah, but he's died, and Jesus says he rebukes them. Right? Don't you know that the Scripture has said these things? Um, I find Jesus' words there. Um, challenging, right? Because there are times in which, uh, I, certainly if I read the Old Testament without the New Testament, I'm not sure that I would have seen it, right? Does it, does it make sense, right? Jesus rebukes the disciples and said, you should have seen this, right? Or um, I always feel very uneasy when Jesus tells a parable and the disciples say, Jesus, what does this mean? And, and Jesus says, you slow-hearted disciples, why don't you get it? And I'm sitting there going, well, Jesus, I don't know that I would have gotten it either if you didn't explain it, right? I feel, I feel the sting of Jesus' rebuke there, right? Um, when we feel the sting of the rebuke of Scripture, it is a temptation for us to lighten the sting. Here Paul says, the light of nature is sufficient that people should see God and they should acknowledge their dependence on God and the superiority of God. But instead, inevitably, what do people do with natural revelation? Well, they suppress the truth and they replace God with gods of their own making. Paul says this is the inevitable action that people do. And what Paul says is that is a condemnable response. Right. As unpleasant as this is, we, we must not deny it. Right. Um, I know uh, when we talk to people, um, even professing Christians have a hard time with the idea of the condemnation of those, for instance, who've never had an opportunity to hear the gospel preached to them, right? That's a hard word, right? That's a, that is not an easy truth. But what Paul is saying here is everyone everywhere God has revealed himself to. And everyone everywhere rejects that revelation of God. And so everyone everywhere is condemned by God. That's the core of Paul's argument here. Um, and what that means is that when I sit down to talk to the unbeliever and I present God to him, I'm not introducing someone new to them. I'm introducing to them the God they already know. Um, and that's true even though the person that I'm talking to 
is an idolater, right? And again, um, as I speak here around the world, the idols that we have in the unbelieving cultures that we minister to look different from each other, right? Where I live, most people's idol is named Jesus, right? It, but it's a Jesus very different than the Jesus of Scripture. Everyone where I live loves God and they love Jesus. But the more I read the Bible to them and, 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 and show them who God and Jesus are, the more they show they, they don't like that God and Jesus, right? You know, you people say, oh, I love Jesus. And you start reading them the words of Jesus and they say, I don't like that Jesus. Well, okay, good. Now we've established that we have two different gods here right? You have an idol named Jesus, and then there's the biblical Jesus, right? That's important that we are able, all of us in our various cultures um, are sharing the gospel with idolaters, right? Uh, those who have rejected the true God and replaced him with an idol, but all of them have done this replacement. All of them know the true God and, and their idolatry is their suppression of the truth of God, right? This, this is Paul's case here, right? He is making a legal case um, showing the universal condemnation of mankind. But it's a legal case that, that has enormous consequences for when I sit down with someone to share the gospel with him, Right? That idea that I'm not, let, let, let me say it this way, right? This is, um, uh, I think, helpful. When I sit down to defend the faith with someone, right? And here, I think particularly of an inquisitive unbeliever or maybe even an antagonistic unbeliever, someone, who someone who's uh, uh, bringing challenges, against Christianity, whether as honest questions or whether in a kind of belligerent way, um, he's bringing challenges against Christianity. Um, oh, where, where was I going? See, this is the problem with it being early in the morning. I, I actually derailed my own train of thought right there. I really hate when that happens. Um, oh, here's what I wanted to say. Yeah, I, I, I remembered. <laughs> Good. I'm, I'm still awake. Um, um, so I sit down, I, I'm sitting down with this guy and we're having this back and forth discussion, right? Even at times, you know, it might get a little tense, a little heated. And the temptation is sort of the natural impulse is to imagine that this conversation is a debate between me and him, right? I have my position, he has his position, and we are butting heads. You know, I'm making my case, he's making his case. We are against each other. And certainly there are times where the conversation seems that way. But if what Paul is saying here is true, and it is, right? If what Paul is saying here is true, it is very helpful for me to think of the conversation as this is the unbeliever versus himself. In other words, what Paul is telling me is that when the unbeliever is, is presenting his case against God, the unbeliever is, is um, arguing against God at the same time he knows that he's wrong. Right? And in many cases, what I'm trying to do in my defense of the faith is not show that I'm right and he's wrong, but I'm going to show him that there are things that he knows, that he accepts, that can't be true if other things that he says are true, right? This is, this is sort of the basics of, of my approach to the defense of the faith. Let me give you just a, a really simple example, right? When I sit down with the unbeliever to have a conversation about the truth of Christianity, the unbeliever, just by sitting down and participating in the conversation, 
um, seems to be assuming that the conversation matters, right? The unbeliever is, is sitting down at the table and he's asking questions or maybe, maybe he's even more belligerent, right? Let's, let's take a really uh, stubborn unbeliever. And he says, you Christians believe fairy tales, right? A more atheistic unbeliever, right? You believe nonsense and fairy tales. You need to get in touch um, with reality. It's a good question, Mark. Let me, let me, let me uh, get, it, it, yes and no, right? Is it a bad faith argument? But the unbeliever is, let's say he's being really antagonistic, right? You, you Christians um, believe nonsense. You believe imaginary things. You need to get in touch with reality. He believes that you are wrong to not just a mistake in what you believe, but that you are morally deficient. You, you are, you are doing something wrong to embrace a myth. But, but let's assume he's right, right? Let's go over to, let's go over to an atheist world, right? The, the atheist world where um, everything starts with the Big Bang, right? That, that everything is at root, and this is a key idea in atheism, everything is at root physics, right? And, and physics gets complicated and becomes chemistry, and chemistry gets really complicated and becomes biology, and biology gets super complicated and becomes psychology. But really underneath it all is atoms doing what atoms do, right? It's physics at root. If he's right that that's the universe we live in, the conversation that we're having is just atoms doing what they do at that temperature and pressure, right? You've got chemicals in your brain doing stuff. And the reality is in an atheist materialist universe, there isn't a conversation happening at all. It's an illusion. It's just physics, doing physics stuff, right? That consciousness is kind of an illusion that sits on top of physics. If he's right about the world we live in, does our conversation matter? If the atheist is right, does the conversation that we're having matter? And the answer is no. It doesn't matter at all, right? We're doing what we do at that temperature and pressure. There's going to come a day when all the suns burn out and everything is cold and dark and empty, and it doesn't matter what we believe. Here's a question. Does the atheist believe that it matters what we believe? Well, he does, because he's having the conversation. He believes it matters. On a Christian worldview, does the conversation matter? Absolutely. Because in a Christian world, it matters what we believe. It matters that we believe it's true and not what's false. Um, it, it's not only just in terms of Christianity that the conversation matters, but how we engage in the conversation matters. Being honest and full of integrity in the conversation. Um, being willing to be corrected and, and to have... Uh, in it, it, that sort of integrity and argument, all of that matters. Um, if Christianity is true, there's a good explanation for participating in that conversation, right? I can tell the unbeliever, I'm being entirely consistent with my own worldview when I sit down and talk to you. But you, even to sit down at the table and to continue the conversation is showing that you really don't believe that we're in the sort of world that you say we're in. Every time you keep talking, right? Every sentence that comes out of your mouth assumes that the conversation matters. And that is an argument against your own position. D does that make sense? Are you tracking with what I'm saying there? right? Which, which means the argument is not between him and me. In some really important sense, the argument is between him and him. 
The argument that I want him to see is that he is an image bearer of God. And because he's an image bearer of God, he knows that life matters and that, the, and that truth matters and that there is a right and wrong. And we ought to believe certain things and we ought not believe other things. He knows these things because he is an image bearer of God walking around in God's created world. But he has created for himself some sort of story in which he can suppress that truth. And, 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 and in some sense, then, what I'm doing is, um, if, we, if we imagine sort of vividly, right, here's this, this dam wall that he's built to keep out the flood of God's truth. And his dam has all kinds of holes in it, right, because it has to. His dam that he's keeping out, he's suppressing the truth. And he's got his fingers in the holes of the dam to try to keep the, the, the God's truth out. And a lot of what I'm doing is just pulling his hands away from the wall, right? I'm, I don't have to, like, um, uh, bring new truth to bear. I will at times. But really what I'm doing is trying to slap his hand away from the suppression of the truth of God right? He knows. And I want to show him that he knows. And that what he says he believes, he, he never, he doesn't live that way, right? Um, um, Mark, you ask if it's misguided and confused or if it's bad faith. And, and the answer is a bit of yes, right? Um, One of the, and, and I need to read this sometime, um, Mark, this will be meaningful to you. It may not to everyone else. Um, there's a, uh, a, a writer on apologetics named Greg Bonson um, who wrote his dissertation. I have a copy of it. I need to read it on self-deception, right? Self-deception is an interesting concept. Um, on, a, on a simplistic level, I think it's kind of silly. So I don't know if this uh, uh, works around the world, but I know people here who are late for things. And because they have a habit of being late, they set all of their clocks in their house 10 minutes forward to kind of trick themselves into being on time. I have always found that pointless because I can't trick myself like that, right? I look at the clock and I go, oh, I set that 10 minutes fast. I still have 10 minutes. The idea of tricking yourself that way just has always seemed absurd to me. But the reality is that, that in a more serious sense, self-deception is a real thing, right? Um, the unbeliever tells himself things that he desperately wants to be true. He doesn't want to be accountable to God, right? And so in, in some sense, he is arguing in bad faith, right? He is telling himself lies. But does there come a point at which the unbeliever believes his own lies and thinks he's arguing sincerely? Well, I, I think that that can be, that can also be real, right? Where the unbeliever doesn't, um, you know, we, 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 there's a liar who tells lies, who knows he's lying, but it's really hard to talk to someone who's telling lies, who believes the lies he's telling, who's embraced the lies. And that's really what we're dealing with with an unbeliever, is he's embraced lies, right? And in some sense, um, he might be aware of the tension between the lies he's embraced and the real world that he lives in. And what we're trying to do is provoke that tension, that disconnect between the lies he tells himself and the, and the created world that he really lives in um, to, to make him feel that disconnect. But, but in some cases, we're dealing with people who I think have, have so fully embraced those lies that they, they're not conscious of the, the lie in, any longer, right? So it's a good faith argument that's misguided. In, in other cases, I, I think there are people that are aware, no, my, my explanation of this, uh, of this evidence is so wholly inadequate that I know I'm misrepresenting things, right? So I, I think it depends. I think there's a spectrum of answers um, uh, to, that, to that question, all right? All right, let's, I, I, this is probably a good time, middle, middle of the class here to take 10 minutes. And uh, 
And so we'll take our 10 minutes or five, or are you, was that a wave or a five? Five? Yeah. Okay. And we'll come, we'll come back here uh, shortly then. Okay. So Alrighty. at uh, 8.56, we'll come back at uh, 9.01. Very good. All right. Okay, Dr. Riley, I think you can continue. Very good. Uh, some great, great questions um, uh, during the break there. And let me, um, let me just read the next verse because in some ways there, that where Paul continues um, sort of anticipates some of those questions, right? So Paul says the unbeliever it's an image bearer of God walking around in God's created world, therefore knows God, right? Verse uh, uh, 21, for although they knew God, right? So, so here's the question. Well, if they know God, then how do we explain their current position, right? Whether it's uh, idolatry in, in, in a um, more natural sense of, of worshiping the created things or idolatry, for instance, as, as um, uh, one of the questions here is Islam, right? The, the substitution of God for something other than God, right? Um, what, what scripture is, is, is saying is all of those things are a substitution, Right, they they are uh, rooted in a rejection of the God who has revealed Himself, and a putting something else in the place of God. Right. So the, the point is, the unbeliever does not begin with neutrality, and then is groping toward God. The unbeliever begins with a rejection of the God who has revealed Himself, and a substitution of something else. Right. So let's see it in, in the text here. Right. Verse 21. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him. And then this is, uh, again, key to our uh, understanding of apologetics. But they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. What Paul is doing in verses 21 through 23 is explaining the origin of idolatry, of all idolatries, right? All idolatries, Paul says, are, are culpable. They are, they are actions of rebels against God. Right? Now, we can believe this without, again, being antagonistic about it. Um, but I think it's important for us, there, there's, there's two broad ways of thinking about um, other religions, right? The, the, the one way is to say, man is, is, is very, it starts out from a point of neutrality, and all of his religion is an attempt to try to find the true God. And, and they're misguided attempts to try to find the true God. The other way, and closer to what Paul is saying here, is that man's religion is an attempt to evade the true God, to replace the true God. It is not virtuous, but vicious, right? That, that idolatry is not a, a good-hearted groping to get to uh, the truth, but a rejection of the truth and a substitution for it. Um, again, this is not easy. It's not um, a, a happy thought, but, but this is Paul prosecuting the case. When the unbeliever worships idols... Paul doesn't say, oh, you're halfway there. Paul says, your idolatry is a symptom 
of your rejection of God. It is not your, your half embrace of God. It is your rejection of God and a substitution. Right? That is why Paul says, and again, we've got to get the context of Romans 1. Paul is building the case that when God displays his wrath, he has done so justly. Right, And so if, if we're going to be Christian on this, we have to accept the case that Paul is building. And the case that Paul is building is that, is that, is that the religious practices that we find around the world are actually symptoms of unbelief. They are, they are evidences of man's rejection of God, not evidences of man's partial embrace of God. His, his religious practices deepen his condemnation. They don't alleviate his condemnation, right? Um, and that's, again, this is not, but, but it, it presses on us, I hope, the, the urgent need of evangelism. Right, that it's not man is 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 good as far as he goes, but just needs a little help. No, where he has gone is just deepening his his rebellion against God. Right, um, that that he he begins from a place of condemnation because he has rejected God as God has revealed Himself, and then he hardens that rejection. Um, and, and I want you to start seeing this in the text, right? Um, look at verse 21 again, right? Although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him. And then you've got this, this um, sort of passive voice construction. They became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. Now, Paul's going to make this more explicit as the text goes on. When it says that they became futile in their thinking and their hearts were darkened, um, um, Romans ten fourteen is what? Off, I don't have that off the top of my head. Um, so the idea that they've never heard? Certainly the, the idea, at, at least in part here, um, I, I think in the context, um, what we know of God in creation is the true God. But we, we certainly, so, so for instance, um, uh, at best, at best, there are Trinitarian illustrations in creation. But if anyone says you could deduce the triune God, right, the doctrine of the Trinity from creation, I'm going to be deeply skeptical, right? The message of salvation is not found in nature, right? And, and so in that sense, the, the unbeliever, um, and I think uh, specifically here, when it says, how will they call on him in whom they have not believed? How are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? This is coming right off uh, 10, th 13. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. In the context of Paul's argument in Romans, Romans 10, that's Jesus, right? Um, now, we, 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 we want to uh, articulate this carefully. Jesus is not distinct from God. But when Paul talks about calling on the name of the Lord, he is speaking of conscious knowledge of Jesus as the Savior, the second person of the Godhead. That is not revealed in nature, right? In that sense, they have never heard. But it, is, it, it also has to be the case that what Paul says in Romans 1 is true, that they have rejected God. Right. So, so I would, I would make that distinction along the lines of God in himself, right. Uh, versus the, the, um, the specific knowledge of Jesus Christ. And, and that is true, right. That is why there is no, um, there is no thought of saying, well, God has revealed himself in nature. And if people just respond rightly to that, God will accept them for responding to the light they have. What Paul says is, no, unless they hear the gospel, they cannot be saved. And they do not just hear the gospel from nature. 
right? This is why the, the, the task of evangelism and, and the task of global missions is so essential, is that, is that the, the nature is sufficient to condemn, but is not sufficient to bring salvation, right? That, that, um, that the knowledge of God in nature is it, when man rejects that, they they have made themselves guilty, right? And and in terms of the the objection that that raises, um, because man rejects the revelation that God has given him, we need to um, the, the 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 question that um, we we often face is this doesn't seem fair. Right? Does God, that God condemns people who, for instance, never heard the gospel? Right? That doesn't seem fair. Um, one of the most important things we can do theologically is recalibrate our scale fairness. Right? Um, what the Bible tells us here, what Romans one is telling us, is that God has revealed Himself in nature, and what all people do with that revelation is they reject the God who has revealed himself and substitute some other God, right? At that point, what does God owe them? And Paul's answer is what God owes them there is condemnation. God does not owe anyone further revelation. If, if what we've received from God, we've taken and, and corrupted, God does not owe us further revelation. Right? So the fact that we've even heard the gospel, and, 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 and I, I hope this, um, this isn't just intellectual and theological for you. The fact that you are someone who has heard the gospel is already a mercy of God in your life. It is, it is the grace of God that someone brought the gospel to you. And it is grace upon grace that God has opened your heart to receive that gospel. Right? Because our natural state, and, and we just, um, when, I, when I said in the first hour that um, uh, the good news is only as good as the bad news is bad, um, we don't have, I don't think, nearly enough hymns. Where, where we sing about just how lost we were. And, and, and we need more hymns about, about how, how um, absolutely lost we were, how absolutely, not, not just in our own sinful choices, but just, just at the point of birth that we were under the judgment of God and that God has been so gracious to us, right? Again, this is, this is a hard truth for most people because, because we have a very, very high view of what we deserve from God, right? One of the things it, it, that we, we, we've got to work on in our own hearts, in discipling the people in our church, is recognizing that what we deserve is judgment. What everybody deserves is judgment. And we deserve, I mean, this is what Paul is arguing here. This is the core of Paul's argument in Romans 1, is that, is that everyone everywhere is under this judgment. And unless God intervenes by bringing us righteousness through Christ, do you see how hopeless we are? Right? That's what Paul wants us to understand. You, you read this and you go, well, that's really bleak. Yes, that's the point. Like, this is really bleak. We're idolaters. We take what God has shown of himself and we reject it and we twist it and we make something else of it. And that means we are guilty. So, so what I, what I, where I was going, and, and I want you to see this, that language at the end of verse 21, right? That um, uh, unbelievers have become futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. Paul's going to make this explicit as chapter 1 unfolds. When we speak of the unbeliever's mind being darkened, is that just something that happens? Or is that an act of God? 
the unbeliever's mind being darkened, right? That passive voice there. Their, their, their thinking became futile and their foolish minds were darkened. Is that just something happening or is God doing something? And, and, and what we see in part as the chapter goes on is this language in the, in the rest of chapter one that God is giving them over to what they've embraced, right? And I think in the context of Romans one, that's what we should think of when we think of the unbeliever's mind being darkened. Um, can, I, can I get you to turn to a, a, a parallel text? I want you to see, uh, go to Ephesians four. Um, so I'm currently teaching in our church a Sunday school series on Ephesians 4, um, or on Ephesians. We're in Ephesians 4. Um, I, I, I can't do the entire thing, and, and, and I, I don't want to this morning. We're, we're supposed to be doing Romans 1, but I want you to see um, how Paul um, makes this same case in another, uh, another of his writings. Um. Chapter 4 opens with the, the idea of we have this unity that's been given to us as a gift in Christ, right? Um, the body of Christ is one thing that God has made. But then in verse 7, he says, within this unity, we have this diversity of gifts. And, and, and he talks about the ascended Christ giving gifts to his church. And in this context, the ascended Christ gives the gifts of the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers. And what all of those gifts have in common is they all have a teaching function, right? Apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. Um, there are differences in those offices, but all of them are part of the teaching offices of the church. And I think that's in, uh, in, incredibly significant because as it goes on, um, that paragraph um, uh, that runs through uh, verse 16 of chapter 4 is all about how one of the most significant things that is happening in your local church and in mine is that the body of Christ is being built up through teaching, right? There are other things that we do in the church that build up the body, but um, notice that, 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 that these offices, verse 11, are given to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ, Verse 13, till we all attain to the unity of the faith. And for Paul, almost without exception, the faith is not um, personal and subjective, right? Your feeling of faith, but it's the body of truth, right? Christian doctrine, right? The unity comes from the shared truth that we all embrace, that is taught to us. And... And I, I just want you to see all of the teaching and mind words in this paragraph. Until we attain to the unity of the faith, the knowledge of the Son of God, right? Mature manhood, the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. What is the sign that we have come to this? Um, that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine. Rather, verse 15, speaking the truth in love, right? You have this huge emphasis that what is going on in the church is the building up of the body through the proclamation of truth, right? And that is the means by which, one of the chief means by which, Christians grow up into spiritual maturity is the teaching and the embrace of truth so that the, the body is no longer uh, swayed by all of these other doctrines. By contrast, right? And I want you to see the argument in, in chapter 4. Look at verse 17. Now this I say in testifying the Lord, by contrast, that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. I don't think he's changed topics here, right? You've got this contrast between Christians who are taught truth and the unbelievers who are given to empty thinking. They are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the, uh, uh, because of the ignorance that is in them due to their hardness of heart. 
I, I think it's very interesting, right? If you want to follow the connection, verses 17 and 18. When we t- speak of not walking like the Gentiles do, that's our life, our manner of living, right? Don't live like an unbeliever, right? Why do unbelievers live the way they do? Well, keep following the verse. They live that way because they think a certain way, right? In the futility of their minds, they're darkened in their understanding because of their ignorance. Why do they think the way they do? End of verse 18, due to their hardness of heart. In other words, and I, I don't think it's it's as simplistic as this, but if you just follow the logic of, of Ephesians 4, verses 17 and 18, the unbelievers live the way they do because they think the way they do, and ultimately because of their the, 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 the um, uh, disposition of their heart, because they reject God, They are given over to a futile way of thinking that leads to their depravity of life, right? Because they're in their, in their heart, they are rebels against God. It causes them to think in a warped way and thus to live in a warped way. You, you can actually uh, keep unpacking that all the way through Ephesians 4. Um, we don't really have time to do that the rest of the morning. I want you to go back then to Romans 1 with that idea in mind, because I think Paul is saying the same thing here. The unbeliever has in his heart, even more than his mind, in his heart, he has rejected the God who has revealed himself. And because of that, and, and this is the theme through the rest of Romans 1. God gives them over to what they want. And the evidence of God giving them over to what they want is that their minds can um, increasingly embrace what is false. The unbeliever's um, worked thinking is a product of his warped heart. That matters for apologetics, right? The unbeliever doesn't reject God because of inadequate arguments. His arguments against God come from his hatred of God. It is not that his hatred of God comes from his arguments. Right? The rejection of God is not rooted in argument and rationality. It is rooted in rebellion. Which means that when we're doing apologetics, this is why uh, we, we don't come to the table thinking that the unbeliever is neutral and that what he just needs is arguments and evidence. The, the, the unbeliever is a rebel who needs to surrender more than just a seeker who needs evidence. His his, um, uh, analysis of the arguments and evidence is going to flow out of his unbelieving heart. And and so what we're doing uh, as apologists in many ways... Now, he, he is warping the evidence, and we need to, we need to discuss that, right? Uh, if he wants to discuss evidence and arguments, I am willing to discuss arguments and evidence, because as a believer, I believe that all the arguments and evidence are on my side. Christianity is, in fact, true, right? The Christian God is the one true God, and the universe is the way he has said it is. I am perfectly willing to discuss arguments and evidence, But I need to know that the unbeliever is not impartial. That that he is a rebel against God. And and, um, the conversation needs to drive to that point. Is that that the ultimate call is not to rationality, but to repentance. And without repentance, he won't see the truth. What does it look like when the unbeliever is given over 
to his depravity, right? When he rejects the truth of God, when he suppresses the truth by means of his unrighteousness. Um, well, and this is, this is a, um, certainly a passage that um, uh, we have seen um, sort of increasing evidence of uh, in many of our cultures, right? We, we first see it in verse 23, um, in, in the embrace of idolatry, right? Paul says this. So as an example of Paul's apologetic is in Acts 17, right? He goes, he goes to uh, Mars Hill in Athens. And he really pits the unbelievers there against themselves, right? He says, your own prophets tell you. Your own prophets say, in him we live and move and have our being. Right? He's not far from every, every one of us. If what your own prophets say is true, then it, it, it is the case that God is not made by human hands, like all of your idols here. Right? If in him we live and move and have our being, then why do you have a statue of God? Those two things are not compatible with each other. Right? Paul is, is, is displaying to them the incoherence of their own unbelief and calling them to repentance, that, that God has ordained Jesus to be the judge of the earth and he's proved it by the resurrection of the dead. And all of that only makes sense if Christianity is true, right? He's, he's preaching Christian truth to them. Um, but he's doing so by showing the incoherence of, of their own position. Now, this is going to look different as we confront different versions of idolatry, right? Um, let me give a for instance. Well, someone asked about Islam, right? Someone asked about Islam. Um, if I'm going to answer the unbeliever, um, it's going to be helpful for me to know something about the nature of his unbelief, right? So, for instance, with Islam, um, I think it's useful to understand that is in Islamic thought, Allah, it, because Allah is God, he can do whatever he wills, right? I am not going to claim to be an expert on Islam. That is not my primary field of study. Um, you would be, you would have to do a lot of work to find a Muslim in Michigan's Upper Peninsula where I live, right? It's just not a thing here. Um, if you go down to lower Michigan, there's the city of Dearborn, which is predominantly Muslim, right? It's not that there are no Muslims in, in Michigan, uh, where I live, but, but in the upper peninsula, everyone up here is from Finland or Norway. Uh, everyone here is either Lutheran or Catholic, right? That's, that's where I live. Um, uh, uh, we have no diversity of any sort here. I've, I've, I've said, I've told people, um, uh, my congregation diversity is people from Finland and other kinds of white people, right? That's diversity. We have Finns and other shades of white people. Um, so I, I'm not going to claim to be an expert on Islam, but my, my understanding of Islam is, 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 is again, uh, Muhammad taught that Allah being God, is, is, is able to do anything he wants to do. So much so, and again, I'm willing to be corrected if, if, if someone knows more than I am, that Muhammad himself um, was not able to be sure, to be absolutely convinced of his own salvation, right? Because Allah can do whatever Allah wishes. And if Allah wants to condemn Muhammad, because Allah is Allah, he can do whatever he wills, right? Allah is pure will, all right? Let's assume that's true. Let's step over into the Islamic world view and examine it on its own terms. If that's true, can I know anything? Well, I really can't because anything I know is subject to the whim of Allah. Everything I thought I knew, Allah could change. 
because Allah is pure will. Now, that is very different from the Christian God, right? Is, is it true that God, and, and this is a trick question, um, um, can God do anything he wants in the Christian system? This is a bit of a trick question. Can God do anything he wants in Christian theology? How is God different from Allah on this, on this question? Yeah, God, God has a nature, and he will not contravene his own nature. He will not contradict himself right? And so in a Christian world, God cannot lie. If God has said something, I know with certainty it will not change, right? Um, you, you see this at the end of, of Romans 11 as Paul uh, expresses his confidence in the future redemption of Israel. And he says, for the gifts and calling of God are irrevocable, right? In a Christian world, if God has said something, it is true and trustworthy and cannot change. If I step over into a Muslim world, right, into, an, in, into the world as Islam says it is, I lose the ability to know anything. I lose any confidence, right? So, so uh, I, I tell the Muslim, so if I embrace Islam, I am sure to be saved, right? And the Muslim says, probably. Right? I have no incentive to embrace his worldview because his worldview is full of uncertainty. Right? That on his own terms, his position is self-defeating. Right. And what I want to do as I'm sitting down with different kinds of unbelievers who have different kinds of beliefs is do what Paul does in Acts 17 is look at their own position and find that with, within their own position that still holds on to truth. Because he's still that guy who's sitting down at the table with me is always an image bearer of God. Right. He still has hold of some aspect of reality he'll he'll and that's going to be different with different unbelievers that i sit down with right but they're always holding on to some aspect of reality and what i want to show him is that that which he still maintains of god's universe is incompatible with the world that he claims that it is And show him that only by repenting and submitting himself to the lordship of God in the salvation found in Jesus Christ can he have what he thinks he he has. That that for me is 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 sort of the foundation of of what I would argue is an approach to apologetics. Is is I want to show the unbeliever his own futility in thinking that what he has embraced leads him to all sorts of intellectual dead ends, and that the only alternative is repentance and trust in Christ. Right? That that if if I if I reject my idolatry and I submit myself to God, then even for instance, this conversation makes sense. Whereas it doesn't on Islam, right? It doesn't on uh, Roman Catholicism, right? My, my favorite example here in Roman Catholicism is you had a pope very early on in papal history, a, a guy by the name of Honorius. Um, there's, there's the spelling, Pope Honorius. And, and there was a, a particular heresy in Pope Honorius's day um, that had to do with whether Christ has one will or two. And at best, right, if you study the history on this, at best, Pope Honorius was very non-committal and, and allowed for the heretical teaching to continue in the church. And, uh, and, and if, you, if, you, uh, if you understand Catholic teaching, you'll understand the, the, the irony of this. Several decades after Pope Honorius died, there was a church council 
that condemned the, this heresy that Christ has only one will and mentioned Pope Honorius by name as someone who um, allowed this heresy to persist as, as one who is also condemned, right? Now, if you're a Roman Catholic, the idea that you have a pope that was condemned by a later church council for heresy is a non-trivial problem. Like, that's a big problem, right? Because if you hold not just to, and, and, and the idea is not just that there's a historical problem that a Catholic needs to answer, but I'm going to go to my Catholic friend and say, listen, we've got a Pope right now that's debatable whether he's actually Catholic at times, <laughs> right? Can you tell me, Catholic friend, that if I trust this Pope, he will not lead me into error. If it's, it, it is on your own system, if it's the case that in Pope Honorius's day, I, if I trusted Pope Honorius, I could have been led into error. How can you tell me that if I follow Pope Honorius now, I won't be led into error? Right? I'm not pitting my position against his. I'm stepping onto his position and showing that it doesn't make sense on his own terms. Now, that the question that was just posted is a fantastic question. Um, I am going to the unbelieving worldview and showing the inconsistencies of unbelieving thought, right? I'm showing that on its own terms, it fails. And that Christianity is the one and only alternative to that. So what do we do when the unbeliever um, uh, points out what he would say are inconsistencies in Christianity? That's a fantastic question, right? When he uses my own form of argumentation against me, and I'm supposed to be doing Romans 1, but you've asked me an apologetics question that I can't not take the bait for, and so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do a, a little bit of this as, as well. When we're doing apologetics, one of the most important questions that we can um, answer with anybody is, who is your ultimate authority, right? So again, as a for instance, most American Roman Catholics aren't really Catholic at all, right? That, that they, you know, they claim to be Catholic and you say, well, do you believe what the church teaches about birth control or women's ordination or uh, transubstantiation or whatever it is? And they look at you like, no, of course I don't believe nonsense like that, <laughs> right? Um, well, that's good. What we've established is that they're a Protestant. They just haven't accepted how Protestant they are yet. Right? I mean, that's the reality of it, is, is, is they're not actually Catholic. And so for, for me to show, or for me to go to Pope Honorius and to show that the Catholic Church contradicts itself really doesn't matter, because what they've shown is that the Catholic Church is not their ultimate authority. They're their ultimate authority. Right? And what I, want to sh what I have to show them then is, is the, the um, incoherence that results from their being their own ultimate authority. On a Christian worldview, we believe that God and his word is the ultimate authority. Okay? So we've got these competing sources of authority. So I go over uh, to the unbelieving uh, worldview. And I, I, I tell the atheist, right? I'm going to use the atheist as an example again, right? Here's the, the naturalist atheist. I'm going to say, listen, if what you say is true, if we do live in the sort of universe that you say we live in, you can't account for the conversation that we're having. Our conversation doesn't matter. You have no good answer for why I ought I have an obligation. You can't explain why I have an obligation to believe what you're saying. Right? There is no obligation in an atheist universe. Right? There's no there's no accountability. There's no ought in an atheist universe. And you can't explain that. And he comes to me and he says, yeah, but on your worldview, and I'll use what I think is the most important objection to Christianity, 
You say that you have a God who is entirely good and is in control of everything. And yet there is evil in the world. So, so in essence, Christian, you believe that God is in control of everything and yet is in control of things that he doesn't want to happen, which is incoherent, right? How can you say that God wants, that God does everything he wills, and yet there are things that happen that he doesn't will to happen, right? You've got this incoherence in your system, Christian. And so you need to abandon your, your position, right? That looks like we're at an impasse, right? That the, the conversation is now a, a draw, that the unbeliever has things he can't explain. I have things that I can't explain. And, and now uh, the difference between us is not intellectual, but merely a matter of taste, right? Um, neither one of us has an intellectually defensible position, but I like mine more than he likes his. And so, and that's not okay, right? Because what Paul tells me is that the unbelieving position is defenseless, but I need to be ready to give a defense for my position. Uh, according to scripture, my position is defensible, his isn't. So how is it that when I point out an inconsistency in the unbeliever's position, I view it as devastating, but I might have an inconsistency or something unexplained in my position, and I'm okay with that? We'll come back to this question or this this issue of ultimate authority, right? If the unbeliever is his own ultimate authority, and he has an issue in his system that he cannot resolve, what is he left with? Well, then that thing has no answer. Right? If he is, if he's the final authority in his worldview, what he can't explain is inexplicable. Right? He has nothing back of himself that he's appealing to as his final authority. One of the things that we have to, um, we, we have to wrestle with the full weight of in Christianity is if Christianity is true and it is, will we understand everything? If Christianity is true, will we understand everything? And the answer is no. Right? So um, just putting it into categories that I think are helpful uh, I labor under two um, uh, limitations in my mind. I am fallen and I am finite. Right? I'm fallen and I'm finite. The Bible teaches me that there's going to come a day when I will no longer be fallen. Right? When I will be glorified. I will be remade into the image of Jesus. But I will always be finite, right? The Christian teaching is not that one day I get absorbed into God and become God. God is always infinite. I am always finite. On the plus side, what this means is for all eternity, I will still be seeking to comprehend God, right? Um, uh, a God will always be more than me. God is infinite. I am finite. As a Christian, then, it is, it is one of my presuppositions that God's knowledge transcends mine. Right? That, that what I know is a limited version of what God knows. Does that make sense? Right? That's not, that's not a surprise to me. Like when the unbeliever says, you can't explain something, I shouldn't sit there and go, I never expected to find myself in this position. <laughs> right? The reality is if Christianity is true, 
I expect that there will be things that are beyond my ability to comprehend. That's not, and, and to use the language of software, that is not a bug, that's a feature, right? That, that's something built into Christianity, that there are, there are aspects of truth that because God is infinite and I am finite, transcend my ability to fully comprehend. So I believe that God is completely good and holy and righteous in all that he does. I believe that God is in control of every atom of his created universe. I believe that there is evil in God's universe. Genuine evil. I can't fully reconcile those three statements in my mind in a way that makes me go, oh, okay, I get it, right? I, I, don't, I don't ever reach that point. Now, th there's, there's a lot I can say in answer to that question, right? I can, I, can, I can build up my understanding of it, but I never reach the point, right? Um, the, the idea of, of what, what, what is called in philosophy, cognitive rest, right? Um, that, um, that feeling that I have when I've reached the correct answer, right? I, I, I illustrate it this way, that if, if, if we had a, a whiteboard here and I wrote on the whiteboard, two plus two equals five, that's not only wrong, it's a little unsettling to look at. Like, ah, this, this, fix that, that's not right, right? It's, it's like, ah, that's, that, that, that unsettles my mind to see that. But when we get to two plus two equals four, our mind can rest because, okay, that's the answer, right? There are issues in theology that I don't think we can get to that place of cognitive rest that, are, that transcend our ability to, to, to understand it. So why don't I have to give up Christianity when I get there? Well, because that is actually compatible with Christianity. Because I'm not... And, and this, is, um, this is part of what the unbeliever objects to. Part of my uh, Christian theology is that I have to give up being the final authority. I have to give up being the, the final authority in all things. And, and um, submit to God being the final authority. Right? There is not only a repentance of heart that comes with embracing Christ, but there's a repentance of mind. Right? I, I acknowledge that God is right about everything because he's God. A as it relates to apologetics, I, I use this uh, illustration often, and, and maybe it, it'll, it'll be helpful. This is not uh, biblical. This is a uh, hypothetical right? This is a, a revised Bible story. So here's Eve in the garden, right? And uh, Eve is in the garden and, and Satan is tempting her to eat the forbidden fruit. And, and Eve is in a quandary because God has said, if you eat it, you will die. And Satan has said, if you eat it, you will be wise and, and you will be as God, right? And so Eve has these two supernatural, conflicting interpretations of the fruit. She's at an impasse. What do I do? How do I know who's right here? Again, this is not in Genesis. This is, I'm making this up. So Eve picks a, a fruit off the tree and, and there's a deer in the garden and she calls the deer over and feeds the fruit to the deer. And the deer seizes up and falls over dead. And Eve goes, ah, now I know that God is right. I'm not going to eat the fruit. I've seen what happens. Who is Eve's God in that story? In that version of Genesis 3, who is Eve's God? 
Yeah. Yeah. Eve is Eve's God. She is her own final authority. What we recognize in that story, and this gets back to what we were talking about earlier with creation, what Eve should do is trust God. And I want you to tie this into creation. If God is the one who created everything by his word, God's word about things cannot possibly be wrong. Things are what they are because they're determined by God's word, right? Um, for me, my words are truth. If they match something outside me, God's words are truth because when God speaks, reality becomes what God says, right? The causal arrow points in opposite directions with God's words and my words as it relates to truth, right? Once I get that, the most rational thing in the world for me to do is to believe that God's words are true. Yeah, his words make reality, right? It is not irrational for me to believe that God's words are true. It is the single most rational thing to believe that the God who made everything by his word is true and trustworthy about everything he says. But in order to, to take that position, I have to humble myself, don't I? I have to give up what we call autonomy, self-rule, and acknowledge the authority of God. What, what this means is that coming to God... In a, in, a, in a repentant sense, is not just repentance as it relates to, like, sin or my heart, but it, as it relates to my mind as well. Do you see the apologetic implications of this? That when I talk to the unbeliever who thinks he has rational objections to God, if I merely answer his objections and show him that there are good reasons for him to believe in God, I can put him in the very same position as Eve feeding the fruit to the deer in the garden. Look, I've proved to you that God meets your standard and you should embrace God. Right? I, you fed your fruit to the deer and the deer seized up and die. Therefore, God meets your standard and you should believe God. In part, what I'm doing when I do apologetics is I want the unbeliever to see, listen, if you have the standard where you have to be the ultimate authority, you're left with incoherence and irrationality. And the only way to save rationality is by giving up your seat on the throne and saying, you know what? In God's universe, there is ultimate rationality and coherence, even when it's beyond me. And because I live in that sort of universe, I can know things even though I know imperfectly. In other words, I don't have to have exhaustive knowledge because God does. And what God has told me is true and trustworthy. And even if I can't figure everything out, I can know the things that God has said. So for the unbeliever, when he is confronted by an inconsistency or an incoherence in his position, it can destroy his whole position. But when I'm confronted by something that is inconsistent or I can't fully explain, that is actually perfectly consistent with a Christian position. And it's not because I believe that everything's irrational. It's because I believe I'm not the final answer for everything. Does that, does that make sense as a, as, as a response to that? Now, will the unbeliever accept that answer? Well, not if he stays an unbeliever, right? That, that answer is not acceptable on his own terms. But it, it's showing the nature of the, the, the disagreement between us, that the unbeliever is a person to whom God has revealed himself, but the unbeliever has rejected the knowledge of God found in creation and in, in his own image bearing. And he has replaced God with some kind of idol. And because of that, God continually gives him over to darkness of mind. 
right? And we, we I mean, we, we're, we're essentially out of time here, but, but just making one observation, right? That, the, that darkness of mind, obviously in the rest of Romans 1, leads to a whole chain of depraved actions. And, and, and one, of, one observation that I think we need to make here is, is obviously that one of the, the big controversial texts here in Romans 1 is Paul's clear condemnation of homosexuality, right? That is increasingly controversial um, as a Christian position now. Why is that? Why is that? an evidence of a darkened mind. Why does Paul use that as an example of people being given over to a darkened mind? And I, I think the example or the reason is something like this. Um, someone asked earlier about um, Romans 10, 14, that the, the, the people have never heard of Jesus, right? Um. It is true that when the unbeliever who has not been evangelized rejects God, he has not rejected the teaching of Christianity because he hasn't been exposed to the teaching of Christianity, right? What Romans 1 is teaching is that the, as the unbeliever's mind is darkened, he increasingly doesn't see even what he should see from nature. Right? So there are things that the unbeliever should see in nature, and then there's things that the unbeliever sees in special revelation, like scripture, right? God does not hold the unbeliever accountable for rejecting scripture that he has never seen. He does hold the unbeliever accountable for rejecting the revelation that he has seen. And as the unbeliever, we, we, we see this, this cycle, right? We see this in people where, where they... Um, Embrace sin, and as they embrace sin, they become more and more self-destructive, right? That, and, and, and more disconnected from reality, right? To, to use the, maybe an obvious and extreme example, you see this with um, drug addictions, right? As, as people uh, embrace a self-destructive behavior, and they, and, and here's the, the scary thing, they rationalize it to themselves. They rationalize what is irrational. I think the reason that Paul puts his finger on homosexuality as a sign of a darkened mind is that the point is it doesn't take like deep knowledge of special revelation to understand how anatomy and biology are supposed to work. And I'm not trying to be glib here, right? Um, it, it's a certain kind of darkened mind, a mind that is irrational, that refuses to see what is patently obvious even in the created world. And, and so the reason that Paul points to homosexuality as an, as an instance of a darkened mind, the reason he spends several verses talking about that, is, is, a, is a society that justifies and embraces homosexuality, or as is increasingly the case in America, transgenderism. You're looking at a society that not only is rejecting supernatural truth, but is just increasingly unable to see natural truth. Does that make sense? It's a sign of a darkened mind. And, and so Paul is, is showing us when you reject God and you replace God with idols, what, what is going to happen is, is that your, your culture becomes increasingly unable to see even basic truths, even natural truths. Um, and, and I, I think that's a, a great deal of what the, the rest of the, the chapter is. Yeah. And, and that was, um, um, well, I, I and, and I, I, I assume you're speaking there of, of Ravi Zacharias and certainly he's not unique here, right? Um, uh, the, the question of how to defend Christianity in light of the moral failings of, uh, Christian ministers. The first is, I, I, I don't think we should make light of it at all. Um, we're out of time here, but let me say this really, really quickly, hopefully. I, I'm preaching through First Thessalonians right now. 
And one of the things you see in First Thessalonians is how much Paul um, emphasizes the integrity of his ministry in Thessalonica. And I think he does so not only to defend himself, but, but he does so because I think especially in the early church where you couldn't compare Paul's teaching to the New Testament because there wasn't a New Testament to compare Paul's teaching to. How do you know that Paul is teaching the, the true gospel? And, and a big part of the answer is, well, look at his life. That, that your life becomes a significant part of the measure of whether you're teaching what's true. I don't want to ever minimize the offense to the truth of the gospel of corrupt ministers. Right? We shouldn't make light of it. It is true. That is, that is, that is, it undercuts the credibility of the Christian message. Um, but I can say that because I have a standard within Christianity to condemn the behavior of Ravi Zacharias or, or any of these others, right? Um, I, I, but but we, we have to be consistent on that, right? Where those failings have happened, we call them out as failings um, and we don't, we don't cover them up. Um, there's, there's more to say there. We're, we're out of time. I hope this is useful. Um, uh, Romans 1 is, is a very, very, very important passage uh, in our theology and in, in our apologetics. And, and so I hope uh, working through that this morning was, was useful to you all. All righty. Um. Uh, Dr. Riley, do you have any, uh, any other recommendations for extra reading on, on this? I think the, the, the best overview book of apologetics that from the perspective that I would argue for apologetics is John Frame's book on apologetics. I think it's, I think it's either called Christian apologetics. There's a, there's a new and old version of it, but it's the same book. Um, he used to, it used to be called apologetics to the glory of God. Um, I think it's now called Christian apologetics and then it has a subtitle, but John Frame's book is a, is just a really solid introduction um, to to biblical apologetics. That's probably my favorite um, book to recommend on that. Okay. All right. So uh, we've come to the end. Uh, thank you, Dr. Riley. And uh, yeah, we'll catch up again. Uh, Very good. Thank, any thank you for having me. You, uh, I think uh, I'll let uh, uh, Dr. Arnold post it to all of you. All right. Good night. Oh, good morning. <laughs> <laughs> good day. Yeah.